Hello, my name is Gordon Palmer, I'm Minister here at Claremont Parish Church, and this is our service for Sunday, May the 30th. Uh, Miriam Murphy, our children, youth and family worker, will be joining with me in the service. She'll be leading us in our opening prayers. The psalmist says, Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His love endures forever. Our opening pr hymn, Praise the Lord, ye heavens adore Him. inspiration for this prayer comes from Psalm 24. Let us pray. Lift up your heads, O gates, be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall enter in. I say again, lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall enter in. We lift up our hands and our hearts to you, that you may find your dwelling place in us, O Lord. We lift up our eyes to you, O Lord, so that our gaze would not be in toil and trouble, in darkness or despair, but in your glorious light and joy and power over all creation. We thank you with the psalmist in Psalm 24 that the earth is yours and everything in it, every detail of our life written in your book, every care of our hearts inscribed in your hands. We are yours, the flock of your pastor, which you have won for your glory. Together we gather today in our homes to glorify your name and once more claim you, that you are our King and God. Lift up your heads, O gates, open your hearts, you who do not yet know his glory, and let him enter in to take dwelling. Be lifted, you doors. May there be no hindrance for God's word to pierce through our minds and hearts today. And may we see his glory. You are worthy to be called our King and God. Yet we are unworthy to come into your presence if our hearts are not pure and if our hands are not clean. Who can enter the mountain of God? Lord, forgive us for we have sinned in words and deed. And we are not worthy to meet the King without your forgiveness. Forgive us and cleanse us. Forgive us if we have thought of ourselves better than we are, and if we have rejected your offer of love to us, thinking we are beyond redeeming and unlovable. Help us, Lord, not to fall into either of those traps, thinking of ourselves too highly or too lowly, but help us to see ourselves with your loving eyes, which see the truth in us and of us. In spite of our mistakes and failings, you love and accept us. And you, you welcome us into your presence due to the sacrifice of your Son, Jesus Christ. Be lifted, 
the doors of unbelief and despair. Be lifted, discouragement. Be lifted, fear and worry, that the King of glory may enter in, that his glory may fill our hearts and minds today and forever. For we are the generation to worship him in our time, in this place. Our Father in heaven, Today we finish our series in the letter of James. We're going to be reading from verse 7 of chapter 5 through to the end of the book at verse 20. So James chapter 5, verse 7 to verse 20. Listen for the word of God. Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too be patient and stand firm, because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers and sisters, and as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the, the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear, not by heaven or by earth or by anything else. All you need to say is a simple yes or no. Otherwise, you will be condemned. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you ill? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the ill person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and, and someone should bring that person back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. Amen. Now, I don't often... Um, include quotations from books and sermon, but I thought I wanted to share um, a section from this classic work of, of theology with you this morning. <clears throat> Hello, said Piglet. What are you doing? Hunting, said Pooh. Hunting what? Tracking something, said Winnie the Pooh, very mysteriously. Tracking what, said Piglet, coming closer. That's just what I ask myself. I ask myself, what? And what do you think you'll answer, said Piglet. I shall have to wait until I catch up with it, said Winnie the Pooh. Pooh Bear is busy, but busy with what? Even he doesn't seem to know. 
It's a problem that's not unique to poor or unique indeed to the fictional world. A lot of life, a lot of living in our rich Western society is about just passing, just filling our time, keeping busy, whether at work or with a hobby or three, or with pastimes, with just something that fills a space. Time is something to be used up, and used up as easily or as happily as possible. What's at the end of it, whether or not what we are doing now has anything to do with what's at the end of it, is something that most don't consider. I suppose some folks will say they don't know what's ahead, what's beyond death, so just make the most of it now. Others find that hard to just live with, so we get all kinds of claims made from people saying that their dad's been watching over them, or they could feel their deceased brother's presence, or their reunited relatives are no doubt having a pint together. And yet there's no basis for any of that. And it's one of the failures of the Christian church, I believe, that we have not clearly enough, not convincingly enough, believed and shared the hope that the gospel gives. Time is not something just to be filled in. We don't have to invent meaning or purpose because they are God-given. Nor do we have to rely on wishful thinking about some ethereal existence that the predeceased might be tasting. In New Testament times, Jesus' followers were aware of a calling and a purpose to follow him, to live for him in everyday life, because not only was he a Savior who had died and risen for them, but a Lord who was returning again in glory. Jesus' story fitted into that whole story of God in the world, reaching back to creation through the fall, through the tragedy of human sin, through the promises of God sending a Savior, to the time now when the the Savior had come, had died, had risen, and had gifted His Holy Spirit to the church, for the church to live out the reality of Jesus in everyday life, knowing that one day He was coming again. And then in that day, all that had been done in Jesus' name would be gathered up and woven into the new creation, which the redeemed would enjoy forever. And the word enjoy is just as important there as forever. God's purposes can be confusing in their detail and in the many twists and turns of life that we pass through. But the overall shape is not in doubt if we believe Jesus he is coming again. The kingdom of God delivered through Jesus' life and death and resurrection will one day be fully realized after the day of judgment, and God and his people will live in the fullness of life, bodily fullness of life forever, where there will be no more sin to upset, nothing to destroy or ruin their existence, where no good will fade and no evil will be present at all. That's what Jesus promised. And confidence in that promise, confidence that Christ is coming again, has been foundational in all that James has been sharing through this letter. He's been writing to a small, to a suffering church, and he affirms that the difficulties are worth it. Keep persevering. Sure, he's spoken of help. He's spoken of blessing from God along the way. He's spoken of God drawing near as well as speaking of the temptations and trials and challenges. But always, throughout it all, he's fortified by the thought, Jesus will return. He's confident because he's aware that his life, the life of the believers that he's writing to, And indeed, the lives of all who are Jesus' people are part of this great sweeping story of God's salvation and God's ultimate triumph. And so there is meaning, so there is purpose, so there is direction. And so he urges, verses 7 to 12 of chapter 5, for some patient waiting. James can urge us to be patient because we can be sure the Lord will come again. And the basis for believing that is all that we have and know of the story of God's salvation until now. 
Would God really send his son in the likeness of sinful flesh so that Jesus could live that life where he was so often disregarded, mistreated, let down? Would, would, would he have done that and endured betrayal and crucifixion? Would he have done that and then kept the promise to give the Holy Spirit to us and then say, oh, no, I just, that's enough. I, I, can I be bothered? I'll just leave it there. When James says, verse 8, that the Lord's coming is near, he's not saying that it must be very soon in terms of days, months, or years. Clearly, it's not been. We're a couple of thousand years on from this. And the script, New Testament tells us that the coming of Jesus again will be sudden. We will not know to expect it. When, no, when James says it's near, he's saying that all that has stood in its way has been dealt with. Satan is defeated. The outcome is assured. The Old Testament prophets, verse 10 and following, they waited, holding on to the promises about the Messiah coming, and indeed, over time, Jesus came. Jesus fulfilled the promises. They are an example of what can be counted upon. Therefore, trusting in these promises, he says, wait patiently. But he also says in, in verse 8 that we're to stand firm. That is, the waiting patiently is not just hanging about, twiddling our thumbs. It's not that we don't even have to go hunting or tracking with Winnie the Pooh for whatever it is. We can just sit back and wait because God's going to go and get whatever it is for us. No, stand firm because there's pressures against us. It's a time for being faithful. It's a time for resisting all that is ungodly, resisting the devil, as we were saying last week. And again, notice that it's the nearness of the God that gives us the impetus to, to live properly. The judge is standing at the door, verse 9. Kind of handles on the door. He's just about to come into the room. And when he comes into the room, what's he going to find you doing? So we should speak and treat one another in such a way that we would not be ashamed knowing that the Lord Jesus is within earshot. We must wait and wait well with a lifestyle that is Jesus-shaped. So James then urges us to resist, to be patient in suffering, to stand firm. And in verses 13 to the end, he's talking about our trusting. Waiting well involves living lives that show we're trusting God. And I only really trust someone or something if I show some kind of dependence on it or dependence on them. One of the clearest indications as to whether or not we trust God is actually our prayer lives. And so it's prayer that James turns to, verse 13. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let him pray. Prayer is where we acknowledge that we are not sufficient in and all of ourselves, and we need God's help, and we want to trust Him. James wants us to pray in different circumstances, whether they're good or bad. Prayer is not just the fourth emergency service. I'm in trouble here. I really can't ask the police or the fire service or an ambulance to deal with it, so I'll pray. Prayer's not a get-out-of-jail-free card. That's not trusting. Prayer is for all of life. It's when we share life with God and have God share with us and who we are and what we're doing. And there is no situation and there is no circumstance in which prayer is not relevant or not right. Our whole lives are to be lived in fellowship with God, in relationship to God. And that includes verses 14 to 16, times of sickness. Now, I don't think James is saying in these verses that every time someone in the congregation sneezes, elders should come round with grapes and a prayer. Nor is he speaking, notice, about healing meetings. The prayer, verse 14, seems to be in the sick person's home. James seems, and we need a bit of caution here, James seems to be making a connection between sin and sickness. But elsewhere, Jesus has denied that there's a direct correlation or link. Luke chapter 13, 
in the conversation with his disciples. He says, you remember that tower that fell down in Jerusalem and, and killed a number of folks? Do you think they were the biggest sinners in Jerusalem, the people that the tower fell on? No, they weren't. Or again, John chapter 9, when there's a, a man born blind and, and his disciples say to Jesus, well, whose sin caused this? Is it the man's sin or is it his parents' sin? And Jesus says, doesn't it work like that? And so there's not a direct correlation that every time something bad has happened to somebody, that's God picking them out, that's God punishing them, that's God treating them badly for some particular thing that they've done. It doesn't work like that. We live in a fallen, a broken, a hurting, an unjust and a suffering world. And huge harm, huge harm has been done over the years by the cruel teaching that someone has not been healed because they didn't have enough faith. It's simply not true that there is that direct connection. Huge amount of faith, you get healed, not very much or no faith, well, God's not going to bother. And that has caused, as I say, colossal hurt and harm in the body of Christ. And to those who take that position and say, well, of course, Jesus died to take away the effects of sin and, and, and illness is an effect of sin. To those who say that, I want to say, but yes, wasn't, wasn't death a consequence of sin? And how come then, if, if, if that's your line, how come none of these great heroes of faith have survived death? How come all these guys are dead? James himself, or Paul, or Luke, or all the other folks who wrote parts of the New Testament. The heroes of church history, Augustine of Hippo, or Martin Luther, or Hudson Taylor, or Corrie ten Boom, Eric Little, and so, so on. How come none of them have survived? You see, it's not only a cruel position to take, you're not being healed if you, because you don't have enough faith. Not only is that cruel, but it's just ridiculous. Because there is no one who has survived into eternal life on this earth. Lazarus is stone cold dead. The only person who has come back from death to not die again and to live forever is the Lord Jesus himself. But just because there isn't a direct or equivalent connection between sin and sickness doesn't mean that the two things are completely unrelated. For James, um, in these verses, it's not just a matter of faith and healing, but also of sinfulness and confession. He seems to identify sickness with sin and healing with repentance. But the outcomes seem to be the wrong way round in these verses. Verse 15, it's the sick person who is saved. Verse 16, it's the one who has confessed who is healed. That would have been the other way around normally, wouldn't it? We'd have thought that. It's the, the sick person who gets healed. It's the person who's confessed who is saved. But that's not where he has it in verse 15 and 16. And so James is saying that the two things do interact, and we should not rule out the possibility that illness can be part of God's judgment, a sign to us that all is not well and that there are things to put right. Drought in Elijah's day, verses 17 and following, drought in Elijah's day was a particular involvement from God as he was making himself better known, as he was moving on the story of salvation. But that doesn't mean that every drought since makes the same point. Droughts, like illness, are part and parcel of the broken and fallen world in which we live. And there is no hard and fast formula to discern whether or not something is a direct consequence of something we've done. And far, far too often, supposedly holy people have pronounced in ways that are hurtful and wrong. They've spoken out and said it's because of this or because of that. One church leader, I remember seeing in the USA just over, a, well, just about a year ago, actually, prayed very directly and definitely as, a, as an apostle of God that 
the coronavirus would be taken away and beaten. Satan um, was going to be hammered and he had the authority from God. Now, that idiot should be held to account. I wonder how many people taken in by his razzmatazz and everything else then didn't keep social distance, didn't get a mask, didn't take care and subsequently died. There are certainly huge numbers of deaths in the States and many of them caused by that kind of stupidity that said, in God's name, I have dealt with it. They made the same mistake there by a number of the same group of folks saying that a word from the Lord is that Trump was going to be re-elected. And the problem was that they were projecting their political bias, projecting their poor theology onto God, forgetting that we are made in his image, not he made in our image. Were there such hard and fast rules or laws, then the relationship between God and his people would not be one of trust and not one of love. It would just be simply a formula. It would be a bit like reading the train timetable, except that God would be more dependable than that. And the confession, verse 16, that James urges is not something fulfilled in the Roman Catholic practice of going to confession, because it's confession to one another, not confession. See, confession to each other, verse 16, not confession to a priest or a religious specialist. James' concern, rather, is that we together, as church, as the body of Christ, as a fellowship, help one another to live truly for the gospel, help one another to remain faithful, support one another when faith is under attack, and so on. And that, verses 19 and 20, is where he leaves off in this letter. The popular phrase says that a good deed or two covers a multitude of sins. But James knows better. It is not a balancing act of good, a balancing out of good acts and bad acts, but rather a walk with the Lord. It's about fellowship with God. It's about gospel salvation that really matters. And so what covers a multitude of sins is not doing something for someone else, not just a bit of kindness, but rather when we can win people or win people back to the Lord. If when we can turn a sinner from the other of the way, one that will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. And so when we can help someone to find or help someone to refind a living faith, sins are forgiven. And helping someone who has been drifting away from the Lord to return is as rich and as blessed a thing as you and I can do for anyone. A multitude of sins were covered when the lost son found his way home to the waiting father. And it's a ministry for all of us to pray for, to share with, and to show the way of Christ to those who have decided that they don't want or don't need Jesus. And it's a ministry that together we can and, and should share in. And it is when there is real and strong and genuine fellowship that that can be done. It's when there is real and strong and genuine fellowship as the people of God that we're enabled to resist the trials and temptations and the suffering. It is when there's a strong and real and genuine fellowship amongst the people of God that we gather together around His Word and His Word lives in our midst. It is when there is real and strong and genuine fellowship that we see the fruit of the Spirit. We see godliness growing among us. It's when there is real and strong and genuine fellowship that we're able to resist uh, the challenges and the attacks of Satan. It is when there is real and strong and genuine fellowship that we patiently wait and that we trust. And in the waiting and in the trusting, bring the, the life of God to others. And in the challenging times in which we live, it's that calling 
It's that ministry that we all need and that we all need to play our part in. Let us pray. Gracious God, give us eyes of faith to see you better. Give us stronger and deeper trust in you, discerning your ways and following you in all kinds of obedience in whatever direction you call us. In Jesus' name, amen. That patience and suffering, that waiting, that prayer of faith, that, that trusting is when there is a reliance on, on Christ at the, the center. And so we sing, Jesus, be the center. And after we've sung the hymn, we'll confess our faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. But firstly, Jesus, be the center. I believe. Now our prayers for others, let's pray. Lord, you're a God who has given us gifts. You have given in love and you've given out of love. You've not been kind because you've thought, oh, I'm God, I better do something. You've not given because you're thinking, oh, if I don't, nobody else will. But in your love for the unlovely, in your care for the undeserving, in your love for people who had not sought you, you reached out. You gave us a new life in and through your Son, Christ, and also you've given us so many gifts that enrich and bless us in life. Remind us that all of that comes from your goodness and grace, and that faith and love are our to be our response to your mercy your giving, your caring, and your sacrifice for us. 
Lord God, we give you thanks for love and the many different ways in which love has touched our lives. We give thanks for people who cared for us, people who served us when we were helpless and useless and not able to do anything for ourselves. There are folks who stepped in. Folks who fed, who nurtured, who protected us. Lord, we give thanks for people who have supported us, people who have stuck by us, people who have given us other chances. We've given, we give you thanks for people who have surprised us with kindness and, and thoughtfulness. And we give thanks for those who have shared your love with us through speaking to us and through showing us the way of Christ, people who have supported us in prayer, people who have made sacrifices for us. And gracious God, in the way of a society that stretches the individual so much, we pray that you'll help your church to be different. Help your church to give rather than receive, to serve rather than be served. Not as some kind of marketing ploy, but out of faithfulness to you, May our responsibilities be more important to us than our rights. May community be more important to us than selfishness. Lord, help your church to learn to overflow with love. Help your church to show love, to be love. Help your church to resist the temptations to look after self first. And Lord, we pray for those who today are finding your world all very unlovely. Those who are finding themselves just mired and steeped in bitterness. Lord, might someone be able to reach in with kindness, someone be able to reach in and touch and help them. We pray for those who are feeling the pain and the hurt of, of illness and, and weakness. Give strength and courage day by day. Pray for those who are feeling bereaved, and may they know your presence and your comfort, and also might they know the worth and the reality of love given and love received. And may they know a community of loving and caring people with and among them. We pray for those who are feeling that they've lost their way. Maybe there was something once that they were living for. Maybe there was something that enthused, something that excited, but it's just either been taken away or just faded away. Lord, for such we pray that there might be ways of a new exhilaration in life, a new anticipation and expectation that gives hope and direction. Gracious God, in and through Christ, hear these and all our prayers. Amen. We conclude our service with the hymn, Hear the Call of the Kingdom, and then the words of the grace. Thank you for being with us, and may God bless you. Mm -hmm.